You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check out my Patreon. And take a look at my other YouTube channels too. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything I release. All links are in the description. In this podcast, we're going to talk about the Reawaken America tour promoted by Eric Trump, promoting domestic terrorism against the LGBT community. Televangelist Jesse Duplantis' absolute obsession with money. He can't give it up. And this isn't new. It's been like this for decades. Andrew Womack attempting to take over a school board and actually succeeding. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to leave a message instead, you can just go to my website, owenmorgan.com. Click the Contact Me button in the top right corner if you're on desktop. If you're on mobile, hit the three lines in the top left corner and then hit Contact Me in the menu options. Some really stressful shit has been going on in my life lately and I have to take medicine to prevent my anxiety from getting completely out of control. Unfortunately, I wish it weren't like that, but yeah, just about everything that I do in my life brings me stress. Answering the phone, answering the door, checking the mail, everything. I am like a nervous wreck. I'm like a squirrel watching a vulture circle overhead basically 24 seven. The one thing that I can do with my life that does not bring me that type of stress, that type of anxiety, insurmountable fear and pain and disturbance is work. I can work. I love it to death. I love talking to you guys. I love hanging out. I love editing. I love writing. It's just like pulls my mind out of all of that all the time. I love it to death. Well, some pretty disturbing happened immediately before the stream, 7.40, and it's uh, 8.30 now. So I took a little bit of extra anxiety medicine to try to deal with it. So I've informed my mods if it sounds like I'm drunk. <laughs> Forgive me. I if it if it's bad, I've asked my mods to let me know in DMs and I'm just gonna finish the story and move to the you know, and we'll we'll finish it tomorrow or something like that. I don't wanna slur my speech or anything like that. So that's my situation. I don't drink alcohol ever. In fact, I haven't drank alcohol since I was like eighteen, maybe. So this is the closest you will ever see me to drunk. Matter of fact, the only person that's ever actually seen me drunk died a few years ago, sadly. Caleb Smith lost his life. So anyways, yeah, that's what I got going on. Luckily, I haven't had any kind of thoughts or, or ideation or anything to that effect. My will to live is stronger than ever. Stronger than it has ever been. Probably the strongest out of anybody alive, to be perfectly frank. It's just a lot of stress in my life. A lot of stress. So, whew, it's a lot. Anyways, has Owen said what has happened? No, I haven't. <laughs> but I am pretty loose right now. Pretty whatever. Pretty like, I don't give a shit. So, whatever happens, happens. If you were ever going to get the true story out of me, then now would be the time. I take Suboxin. I've taken it for like 12 years, right? Well, Suboxin, one of the side effects is anxiety. Now, I've never, I, I've had anxiety my entire life, but I never had a word for it. I didn't associate a word to that thing. I didn't know what that feeling was called until it became so insurmountable as a result of Suboxone, that it was effectively a panic attack. I started having daily panic attacks as a result of Suboxone. So it is targeted towards certain specific things, mostly money-related, but, you know, that's a story for a different day. As a result of all of the anxiety that has popped up, I find it very difficult to function from day to day and do anything other than work 
or play a video game. I can't clean. I can't cook. I can't check the mail. I can't do anything. I, it, I'm just, I'm at a loss. In fact, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm kind of on the edge of looking for somebody to help me with like accounting and stuff. Not like necessarily somebody that knows how to do accounting, but maybe just like a personal assistant who I can pay to just kind of help me work through the really tough stuff that simply is insurmountable for me. Tears of the Kingdom, am I right, fellas? Look at this game. Flawless game, dude, flawless. Okay, well, there are a couple flaws. First of all, I have no <laughs> clue how to get through this. Oh, that's another thing. I'm going to swear a little bit more than usual, probably. I apologize for that. This game is fantastic, dude. Oh, my God. I love this game to death. God, it's so creative, this game is. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but she's and crackers, guys. It is something else for real, real, not for play, play. That's a really good game. I'm really happy with it, but the difficulty level is significantly amped up from what uh, Breath of the Wild's difficulty was. Like, significantly amped up. I die like every other hit. And they don't have fruits to help you gain extra hearts either, extra buffer hearts, as far as I can tell. Or the fruits are super, 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 super rare. People worried that Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild 2, was basically just going to be like a Breath of the Wild 1 DLC. Like a $70 DLC. I don't think so. I think it's totally 100% worth every penny. I don't think it's a DLC at all in any way. I think it is very much its own game, and it's incredible. I love it to death. Just some really, really cool stuff on there. Can't mix Xanax and Suboxone. Everyone, please tell him this. Google it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's very dangerous to mix Xanax and Suboxone. The reason for that is because they're both central nervous system depressants. So with heroin, I'll just go through this little explanation because it's kind of interesting. With heroin, when somebody overdoses, what happens is they kind of nod off. You know, their, their eyes get heavy. They kind of close or, or, or maybe they're just open, just a wink, you know? And I've seen it a thousand times. Family members, whole nine yards. I've been in the drug scene for a long time. I mean, I'm out of it now, but my whole childhood, my whole life, I saw this stuff, right? See them sitting there with a cigarette like this. They're just sitting there on their chair, rocking back and forth. Eyes kind of closed. Cigarette in hand. And it's drooping more and more and more. They lean forward. Cigarette falls. Burns a hole in their pants. They wake up. Oh! Alpha Force Zero's grandma had... I mean, she wasn't on heroin. She just not off a lot. She just fell asleep a lot. And she had... 16 cigarette burns on her chair's arm all the way down from falling asleep and dropping the cigarettes. That's what happens well. Suboxone and like benzodiazepines, they do the exact same thing. If you take too much, you start nodding off, you get sleepy, you know, you, you, your eyelids get kind of heavy, your speech gets slurred, and you just kind of lean forward like this and and uh, taking them both together compounds the effects on top of each other and makes it twice as simple to overdose on both of them. Taking an opiate and a benzodiazepine together makes it twice as easy to overdose. Now, I'm taking nowhere near enough to overdose. I'm not even close to overdosing. So it's perfectly safe to take as long as it's under doctor supervision and you're extremely careful, and you're not using it recreationally. Using it recreationally is a bad thing. I take it exactly as prescribed, exactly on time. I do not have an interest in developing a new physical dependence on anything or mental addiction on anything. So your fears are absolutely correct about that. But I think I'm okay. I've done enough research into this that I'm comfortable taking it anyways. Taking them together. As long as I don't overdo it, 
as long as I don't abuse it or take advantage of it or any of that stuff, as long as I use it for its exact intended purpose, I should be fine. Thank you for the uh, warning on that. I appreciate it. it. It is important information to know, especially when you're going down this road, you know. Anyway, thank you, uh, Jacob Miser. Budman Buds, I know what you're going through, so what the hell? Give it your dentist. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. A couple of swears may slip out. My editor will catch them at the end, so hope for the best on that one. Ned Finn, I used to get severe panic attacks all the time, but found young, uh, found yogic breathing techniques, and it stopped them instantly. It's easy to do, really works well. I'm sure you can find how to do it online. Oh, I've got my baseline standard anxiety under control. You know, the background anxiety that's there all the time that you just can't get rid of. I've got it. I've got that under control. I've figured that out. Have not figured out how to check the mail yet. I've been taking this stuff for about a week or three or four days, maybe. Haven't figured out how to check the mail without having a panic attack. It's actually taking an action that causes a panic attack, and it's rough, man. It is rough. So, anyways, thank you for the uh, suggestion on that. Thought of the QTube family. One advantage to vaping. Can't burn yourself if you pass out doing it. That's fair enough. I don't intend to nod off, though, so uh, that's not on the list of things that I plan to do. God, I don't, I, to my knowledge, I've never nodded off, just kind of, you know, falling asleep, just kind of lean forward a little, and eyes getting heavy, just kind of close them. That's never happened to me before. Not drug-induced. I mean, just being tired, that's happened, but yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for all of your support, everybody. I really appreciate that very much. Oh, yeah, another medication I'm taking, Wellbutrin, is supposed to t uh, help with OCD, so that'll be nice. Maybe I won't type things backwards constantly. That's a complete waste of my <coughs> time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I try not to swear, but sometimes it just comes out. Forgive me, Budman Buds. I will do my best to avoid that, and I will not do that in the future if I can avoid it. I'm literally terrified of all drugs except pot. Yeah, I understand that. Um, me too. I'm not a fan. I don't like any kinds of other drugs, medications. I've never taken clonopin, Xanax, or benzodiazepines of any sort before in my entire life but once. But when you were in the position that I was in, you got to do something. You've got to do something. I was beyond stress like i was panic attack 24 7 level and again it's not even that bad it's not even like it's not even worth stressing over that much you know these are things that can be worked out these are problems that i can fix it's mostly money related I, like i've been thinking i may not be able to i'm gonna have to cut back on a bunch of stuff but you know it's stuff i can figure out like it's not a huge deal i'll be okay but that stress man it's just eating me alive i just can't focus on anything i've got like constant everything reminds me of it you know so anyways yeah i i feel the same i'm literally terrified of all drugs except pot same boat i'm in the same boat as you but something's got to give man something's got to change so yeah hopefully this does the trick uh, my Suboxone doctor told me he will not prescribe this long term. That If that's the case, I'll go elsewhere. If this works for me, I'm going to do it. If this works for me, I will take an addiction to another medication. I'm not going to abuse it, but I will become physically dependent, and I understand that. It's just I need to get better. That's all, you know. Anyway, thank you, yours truly, number one pony. I appreciate that. You're okay, Owen. Many of us here have mental health issues, and we are with you 100%. You got this. We love you, man. Thank you so much, Nericle. I appreciate that very much. More than you know, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's just like I finally managed to get past the background anxiety that's always there, you know? I, I, I don't feel like a squirrel watching a vulture flying above me anymore on a regular day-to-day -day basis but actually taking steps to do things that need to be done still out of the question 
still out of the question. So I'm upping the dose. I'm taking it consistently for a week until I can finally just check the mail. That's what I need to do. I just need to check the mail. I have a wallet. I got a wallet when I moved to New York City that has a chain on it, and the chain broke forever ago. It's got a little ring on here, but the chain broke on it. I ordered a new chain for this wallet, and it's been the chain has been in my mailbox for weeks, and I can't force myself to go down there and just get the chain. So that's my goal right now, let alone all the other stuff I have to go do. I got a whole cavalcade of things that, that need to be done that I've been neglecting for months and months and months. Uh, forget the cleaning that I haven't been doing and, uh, you know, going outside and uh, brushing my hair and just the whole nine yards. It's been a lot. Only thing I ever, ever want to do is talk on stream. I love it to death. Edit. Love editing. And play a video game. That's it. That's all I can emotionally handle doing. So hopefully this medicine will get me to a point where I can just check the f mail, you know? I just need to check the f mail. That's it. <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, Nerical. I appreciate the super chat. Bill Bomarito, thank you so much for the super chat. Love you. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of the super chats from everybody and, and the support. It, it means a lot. It's a really stressful situation, and honestly, I've been dealing with it primarily since December, but really it's been in the background for two years. Since I moved to New York City, it's been back there somewhere. A year and a half, six months after I moved to New York City, it's been there, and it's been hard. Real, real hard. Doing my best. Love Sundays. Absolutely. I love Sundays, too, because it means I get to hang out with you guys, and it's a lot of fun. I'm really lucky that Working is not the thing that stri that triggers my stress. It's the thing that relieves it, you know? Because there are some people out there, in fact, I've been in this situation, where just seeing that building one more day of my life is too much stress to handle, too much anxiety to handle, and I can't do it. I'm so lucky that I've come to the point where I love doing the job that I do. Not just tolerate the job, but love the job to death. I love doing this, to talk to you guys, to go through the chats and, and the whole nine. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's really, really lucky. Seem to become your swearing conscience. TBC, I'm not against it. To be clear, I'm not against it. I wish many with similar takes as you, or I watch many with similar takes as you, your insights are often more unique. Think you can reach more by being more pointed with how you swear, not criticism. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think you may be right. And that's why I try to avoid swearing and stuff. So, yeah. yeah I think you're absolutely right on that point. And um, that's why I'm trying. I think you're correct. I try not to swear for that reason. Next, we're going to talk about the Reawaken America Tour, promoted by Eric Trump, promoting domestic terrorism against the LGBT community. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon, and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. This story that I'm about to talk about here, this is about Eric Trump, okay? So, this, uh, there, there's this what do you call it, like a, a conference or something, that it's like an on-the-road conference, moves from place to place to place. And it wasn't started by Eric Trump. It's not run by Eric Trump. But Eric has kind of worked his way to the very top of the organization, of the movement, and very much controls the direction that this organization goes. It's called Reawaken America, the Reawaken America Tour. And they have held events at Greg Locke's church and a bunch of other televangelist churches. So we get a super chat from Eric Wander. says, Eric Trump is an insult to all Eric's lol. Yes, that is a fair point. I was actually reading about something. Uh, there's a documentary crew, interestingly enough, since we're talking about the Trumps, there's a documentary tr uh, crew that followed the Trumps around in their final days in the White House. 
I mean, from, you know, the end of the election, November 4th or whenever it was, 2021 or 2020, all the way to when they left, January 20th, 2021. Documentary crew was following them around the entire time. And this documentary crew, they turned their footage over to the January 6th committee for what it's worth. I forget what the name of the crew is now, but here's where it gets interesting. They did an AMA on Reddit, this documentary crew, like the the lead producer, the guy that did all of the interviews and asked all the questions and did, you know, compiled the footage and everything. He did an AMA on Reddit and was asked, what is something about this family that you might know that we wouldn't think to ask? And the answer was, Eric Trump, this guy on screen here, Eric Trump, is scared shitless of his brother, Don Jr. Like, really, really scared of him. And nobody really fully understands why. That's really interesting to me, I think. So anyways, Eric Trump runs this, uh, what do you call it, like a Reawaken America tour. It's really owned and operated by a guy named Clay Clark, who we'll probably see later. But Eric Trump is, by and large, the face of the movement. So there are some things that have been happening recently that I really want to talk about regarding the Reawaken America tour. So let's take a look. This is from early November 2022. Again, it's a little bit older, but we're going to get to some newer stuff soon, too. I can see you thinking to yourself, well, you know, we just heard part of it. Maybe this is, quote, mind. Maybe this is out of context. It makes him sound really bad. It makes him sound like a nutter butter that's obsessed with some ambiguous they out there that's, like, out there to get him or something, right? Let's listen to the whole thing. Let's see what he has to say from beginning to end, okay? Check this out. Get, you stupid white square. Shoot. Get. 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 The way they want to destroy Christianity, the way they want to destroy our families, the way they're destroying our children, the way they're destroying our history, the way they're rewriting our textbooks. Who's they? Are they in the room with us right now, Eric? This is absurd on every level, like every last bit of it. No one is destroying our textbooks. No one is trying to rewrite the family. Is that what he said? Like, none of this is true. Listen again. Our children, the way they're destroying our history, the way... The, destroying our children, destroying our history, right? Either rewriting our textbooks. Rewriting our textbooks. All false, 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 false. I mean, there are no lengths that these people will not go to to convince you that you are persecuted and you need to do something about it immediately. Check this one out. This is just from a few minutes later. I think the same talk, early November 2022. Listen to this. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable what these people are doing to this nation. The way they want to destroy Christianity, the way they want to destroy our families. Like, he wants you to feel persecuted. He wants you to feel like they are after you. Like, there's some ambiguous group out there trying to get you, trying to mess with your life in some way. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable what these people are doing to this nation. The way they want to destroy Christianity, the way they want to destroy our families, the way they're destroying our children, the way they're destroying our history, the way they're rewriting our textbooks. Nobody wants to do that. No one is setting out to destroy Christianity. I'm an atheist, and I'm not setting out to destroy Christianity, okay? I, if it's a byproduct of the work that I do, so be it. That's not my intent. I don't care if you have your beliefs or whatever. You know what I really care about? Nutcases going completely off the rails and taking control of the government and doing everything that they can to make it a miserable place to live for anybody who is not an evangelical extremist. That's what I care about. Now, if people start questioning their Christian beliefs in the process of me debunking some of the things that these people say, some of the things that these evangelical leaders espouse, so be it. 
there isn't some concerted effort, some consolidated effort by atheists to destroy your beliefs, to destroy the family, to brainwash, indoctrinate, or otherwise destroy your children, to destroy or change your textbooks. It's nonsense, okay? All of it. It's garbage. Guys, this is a cognizant war in this country, and I, I don't... Cognizant, he says, okay. ...say that lightly. I'm not like the tinfoil hat-wearing guy. But if anybody thinks that they're not... He said, okay, I'm sorry. Stop it every three seconds. I'll, I'll play the whole thing in a second. I'm not a tinfoil-wearing guy, he says, as he espouses the Great Reset conspiracy theory, the Great Replacement conspiracy theory. I mean, I could go on. He's espousing conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy to make his audience think that there's somebody after them, to make his audience think that they're under attack 24-7. That's what he's doing right now. I'm not a tinfoil-wearing guy, okay? I don't wear a tinfoil hat. That's not my thing. Definitely. Guys, this is a cognizant war in this country, and I, I don't say that lightly. I'm not like the tinfoil hat-wearing guy. But if anybody thinks that they're not weaponizing every single one of these systems, there's only one party that... Who is they? ...weaponizing the systems. And they're doing it for their own benefit every single time. I mean... He says there's only one party weaponizing the system against itself, and they're doing it every single time. Okay, that's something I can agree with. At least we found common ground. Unfortunately, I don't think we agree on which party that is. Well, the reason I show you all of this in the first place is because I want to give you a little bit of lead up to what the Reawaken America tour is, what it's all about, what its goals and interests are, okay? This is from a new Reawaken America tour. This is from mid-May 2023. By the way, they held this event one time at Greg Locke's church, and Greg Locke was a speaker at this event should tell you something about the values they stand for and espouse, but that's neither here nor there. Listen to this video of this speaker mid-May 2023 at one of their more recent events. Get you stupid square. Shoot! Shoot! Uh, this guy, by the by, is named Jimmy Levy. Yeah, I, I wrote it down because it's a weird name. Jimmy Levy. I got on, on American Idol and I went far, went to the end of Hollywood week and you know, I started hanging out more and, and getting more experiences with how sick these people were in Hollywood. He was on American Idol and he went pretty far. Is that real? Just out of curiosity, let's look. I don't even know the structure of American Idol. I don't know how it works. I mean, the guy's lying. There isn't a satanic blah, 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 whatever thing that he claims there is, which we'll hear in a minute in Hollywood. That's just made up. But yeah, sure enough, apparently he was on American Idol. Wow. He was contestant number 31029. He made it in season 18. Miami, Florida is where he's originally from. Jimmy's mother is a supposed psychic, and he himself claimed at the audition that she has the ability to see ghosts. Jimmy recently teamed up with rapper High Res for a pro-freedom anthem, This Is a War. Oh my god, dude. Well, apparently, he, uh, he made it pretty far, as it turns out. Interesting. Jimmy auditioned in Savannah. He sang Wicked Game by Chris Isaac. All three judges voted yes, sending him to the next round. Jimmy was shown in the second part of Hollywood Week in, du in a duet with Nick Mariko called Miami Boys, singing Someone You Loved by Louis Capaldi. Both members of the duet advanced. For, this, for his final solo performance, he sang an original song called Shadow. Afterwards, he was placed in the same deliberation room as Margie Mays, Cat Luna, Sarah Eisen, Peyton Aldridge, Madison Page, Ari Sage, and Talon Everett where the judges revealed that everyone was eliminated. Ouch. So he was eliminated. That's a, a shame for him. But uh, he's found himself once again on a stage, except this time it's a conspiracy theorist stage. Listen to what he had to say at the Reawaken America tour. I got on, on American Idol and I went far, went to the end of Hollywood week. 
and you know, I started hanging out more and, and getting more experiences with how sick these people were in Hollywood. These people are drinking the blood of children. These people are injecting a chemical called adrenochrome that they extract from children that are scared. Yeah, this is disgusting. Uh, this is a full-blown QAnon claim. Let me explain a little bit of this if you guys are unfamiliar with this. There's this thing called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, okay? It was written in, like, the, I think 1905, and it is the root, basically, of all anti-Semitism. Or not the root, but it's like a compilation of all of it over the past thousand years. And one of the claims made about Jews in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this 100, 120-year-old document, is that they drink the blood of children, that they eat Christian children, they eat babies. That's the claim. It's not true. Never was. In fact, adrenochrome isn't even a real drug. Adrenochrome is simply the byproduct of adrenaline in the blood. So it's like when you, say, go skydiving or something, you get a rush of adrenaline through your system, and as that adrenaline is processed in your body, it mixes with other chemicals to link to iron molecules, I believe. I don't remember the exact chemistry of it. And it turns from adrenaline to adrenochrome. It's effectively just disabling its ability to act on your body at that point. Like, your body is turning it into adrenochrome because it's done with it. It doesn't want you to be in an adrenalized state anymore. As a matter of fact, adren uh, adrenochrome is available for purchase uh, by scientists. I think you can buy it on eBay. I mean, it's not that hard to find. But when you take adrenochrome, it doesn't do anything for you. It just gives you a mild headache at best. You know why? Because it's the byproduct of adrenaline. If you wanted a high, just go straight to the source. Get an EpiPen. Stick it in your arm. That's pure adrenaline that, that's coursing through your veins. Jump out of a plane. Do skydiving. A billion ways to get adrenaline. Why would you even want adrenaline? I mean, if people are willing to go all the way, these elites that have all the money in the world and all the resources at their fingertips, just go to the real deal. You want real happiness instantaneously? Get MDMA. That's a straight shot to happiness right there. You want to feel happy permanently? Take Molly. Take ecstasy. That's it. That's all you got to do. Not that I'm endorsing that. In fact, I condemn all drug use of any sort unless it's prescribed to you, and then only as prescribed. But that's beside the point. The point is that there are drugs out there that will create happiness in somebody, that will create contentment, enjoyment, and they're not even that hard to get. Adrenochrome doesn't do any of that for anybody. Now, the claim that he's making here gets really, really complex. I'll explain it in, you know, I'll give you a short version of it. It's a QAnon claim, and the claim is all false, of course. Police get word that Anthony Weiner is, he's a congressman. He really was a congressman. He was really married to Huma Abedin. That's real. That's the real part of the story. And he had a habit of sending his, um, his eggplant, if you will, sending his sending pictures of his duck or his goose or other waterfowl to that effect to all kinds of people. He sent his waterfowl around to everybody. It was a problem. And uh, it finally caught up to him when he sent his duck picture or his waterfowl image to the wrong person. They happened to be underage. They reported him, rightfully so. And he got arrested for it and removed from Congress and the whole nine yards. He was terrible. So anyways, the claim goes, this is the QAnon claim. The claim goes, the police raid Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner's house to find a laptop, right? Now they search Anthony Weiner's laptop to find this video on there. Again, the video is fake. The laptop is fake. Everything about the story is fake. But the video is supposedly, I'll say this in, a, in 
as little a graphic way as possible, in as least graphic way possible. It was a video of Hillary Clinton and Huma Abedin, who was Hillary Clinton's aide at the time, and of course Anthony Weiner's wife, basically torturing this poor kid to get the adrenaline pumping in their blood, like mistreating them terribly with a knife, we'll leave it at that, to try to get their their adrenaline pumping. And now that their adrenaline's pumping, they can drink their blood because it has adrenochrome in it. And that's like, you have to get it from the source. You can't just buy it. You have to drink it straight from the source. That's why they came up with this claim that people are like drinking the blood of children and, and torturing children and all this stuff. Again, the whole laptop thing was false. The whole Human Abedin and Hillary Clinton thing, it was all false. All of it was made up entirely. And it was based off of a conspiracy theory that has existed for a long, long time. It's existed since, well, at least 1905, but long before that, honestly. This is a conspiracy theory that has existed for thousands of years that Jews drink the blood of innocent Christian children. And in 1905, it was compiled into a document called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And it had uh, 27 protocols to it. Supposedly, Jews uh, plan for world domination. Now, I've put together a clip about this that kind of explains what this is. So before we go any further with this, you know, the QAnon explanations and all that stuff, let me just play that clip for you guys so that you can hear straight from my mouth exactly what the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is. If you've heard this before, this clip is about eight minutes long. It shouldn't take too long. I'm just going to flip over so you guys can see it. Listen to my explanation of what this is. In 1902, newspapers in Tsarist Russia start publishing this document called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. They came up with, I don't know, like 15 or 18 of them, or I don't remember exactly how many. They claimed that they found these documents on dead Jewish soldiers, and they were like articles that describe how the Jews were going to, like, accomplish world domination now this is completely made up it was anti-semitic propaganda obviously there was no dead jewish soldier there were no elders of zion it was all completely fabricated from the ground up but it was used to demonize a minority group within the country and if there's one thing we've learned over the past couple of years even it's that Fascists and extremists love to blame all of their problems on minorities. Hitler, when he eventually came around, even reprinted copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and wrote about it in Mein Kampf, like talked about how the Jews are trying to take over and all this other stuff. But in 1923, about 20 years after it came out, it was discovered that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was actually plagiarized, full-blown, copied and pasted, or the, I guess, the writing version of copied and pasted, <laughs> the, the early 1900s version of copy and paste, straight from a, an 1854 satire book, a French satire book that didn't even mention Jews. It was just straight up plagiarized. 80% of it was plagiarized from this 1854 book. Thus, putting the final nail in the coffin, proving that this was completely forged. It was fake. It was just propagandistic bullshit created by, you know, anti-Semites to destroy the Jewish community. So that is what the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is. This is actually a copy of it right here. Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It was compiled into a book in 1905 called Protocols of the Meetings of the Learned Elders of Zion. A little bit longer, but... Yeah, it, it's all fake. It was all completely faked. I'm not exactly sure how many protocols there are. Ten, at least. There may be more than that. Well, anyway, protocols includes things like, uh, just listen to, like, one or two lines here. In miserable Russia, 
The Jews are less than 5% of the population, yet they hold over 90% of the official positions. Russians and Jews are very much different, yet Russia is governed by a mere handful of unprincipled Jews. The 95% of Russians have only a 10% say-so about their own government, and even the 10% in office are but lickspittle, or fronts, to the domineering Jews. To the reasoning mind, such a condition of affairs seems impossible, yet the condition exists. In fact, a careful study to the protocols alone will clear up the mystery. Now that you've read that one sentence from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a book supposedly discovered on a dead Jewish soldier written by Jews in power, listen to what this televangelist Lance Walna says. He's about to explain Seven Mountains Dominionism, or se the Seven Mountains Mandate, which is the televangelist's plan to take control of the country. I'm not joking. This is from early March 2022. 3% of the population, roughly 3 to 4% of the population, are radical leftist elites. 30% of the population are evangelical born-again Christians that are inclined to go towards Pentecostal <laughs> language. I mean, we're really out there. 30% against 3%, but they neutralize the church because they're also in religion. They changed the definition of marriage, so they've taken over family. They've totally taken over academia, so the education institutions are teaching leftist theology or leftist ideology and silencing uh, conservatives. They're controlling government right now. They've taken over legacy media, Hollywood, entertainment, and, uh, and arts, and uh, now they've got Wall Street. These are the seven mountains, the seven areas of society that they want to take over to control society in a Christian nationalist state is what he's describing right now. This came straight out of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, directly lifted from it. Did Lance Walna lift it? I don't know. Somebody did and provided this information to him and he started repeating it. Somebody lifted it directly from Protocols. This is 3%. 30%. Of the, of the population is Christian. How is it that 30% are dominated by 3%? They have a worldview for bringing their kingdom here now. I'm dead serious. This came straight from protocols. Jews are less than 5% of the population, yet hold over 90% of the official positions. Russians and Jews are very much different, yet Russia is governed by a mere handful of unprincipled Jews. I mean, you're seeing similarities, right? There are other similarities. I can't find it at this moment, but there's another part that talks about Jews attempting to spread Darwinism and Marxism through society because they're wonderfully destructive ideologies. They're trying to spread them through society to destroy society. Does this sound familiar? Darwinism, Marxism, saying that they destroy society. The leftists are setting out to destroy it. Seriously. Word for word, the tactics being used on the right at the moment. That's what Protocols of Elders of Zion is. That's what it's all about. That's where a lot of televangelists are getting their ideas from. Directly, I don't know. Setting out to deceive? I don't know. Do, are they even aware of this document? I have no idea. But it's copied word for word in some situations, and it's uncanny. Oh, here's another one. The idea that Jews eat babies or that the elites drink adrenochrome from children. That's straight from Protocols of the Elders of Zion. QAnon is nothing more than a rebranded Nazi death cult. Every conspiracy theory you, you can come up with came from this document. The conspiracy theory that Jews eat babies or that they drink the blood of children, that's from Protocols, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The idea that they control the big banks and the media and all of the other stuff, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's from this document right here. The conspiracy theory that they try to cancel people that they don't like, cancel culture, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's all from this. The idea that Marxism and Darwinism are evil and that they're trying to use it to destroy society, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's all from this. Every conspiracy theory in the past hundred years that you can think of, the Great Replacement, where they're trying to bring in other groups of immigrants to destroy our culture and to outweigh votes and things like that, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. 
the conspiracy theory that Jewish people are trying to enslave the world or, or whatever other thing. It's all from this book, Dead Serious. This is where pretty much all anti-Semitism stems from. Or, well, mm -hmm. I guess that's not exactly accurate. This is a compilation of all anti-Semitism from the past thousand years. It was all put into a book right here and it was passed around nazi germany and get this it was passed around the middle east by the kgb in the 20th century passed around in iran and saudi arabia and all of the other middle eastern countries in that area egypt and all of them by the kgb to make the middle east hate israel even more that's at least part of the reason why Iran absolutely hates Israel and why they're Holocaust deniers or, or, or not not Iran necessarily, but the leadership in Iran. That's why they're like that, because the KGB passed these conspiracy theories around over the past hundred years. So that's the protocols of the elders of Zion. I find it interesting that when I made this clip originally, I was wearing the exact same shirt that I'm wearing right now. That's kind of weird. Anyways. There are 27 protocols. Earlier, I, I said I didn't remember how many there were. There are 27 total. And they're just supposed to be like the Jews' plan for world domination. There never was a group of elders of Zion. Like, it was all made up from the beginning. So when I hear somebody like Jim, what's his name? Uh, Jim, Jimmy Levy? When I, when I hear somebody like Jimmy Levy saying stuff like this, I know that Somebody who has likely read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion probably got to him. Because you don't come to the conclusions like this on your own, that Christians or non-Christians or atheists or Jews or whoever are eating babies and drinking their blood and the adrenochrome. You don't come to those conclusions on your own. They came from somewhere, in my opinion. So let's listen to Jimmy Levy's take on this situation again now that we have that background. I got on, on American Idol and I went far, went to the end of Hollywood week. And you know, I started hanging out more and, and getting more experiences with how sick these people were in Hollywood. These people are drinking the blood of children. These people are- No, they're not. Injecting a chemical called adrenochrome that they extract from children that are scared. This is- No. None of this is true. It's all made up. It's really happening, and this is the most popular chemical used in Hollywood for the youth. It's a fountain of youth, they say. It's disgusting, and it needs to be exposed. Well, there's, uh, s there are some studies that show that if you transfuse blood from younger people into older people, so if you have a, a kid who's like 20 years old, he's never smoked cigarettes, he's never smoked weed, never drank, never done any drugs of any sort, whatever, and he's healthy, he lifts weights, lives a good life, and has lots of muscle mass and jogs every day and all that, if you get a blood transfusion from him every day or every week or whatever, it's been shown scientifically through studies that you do live longer. So there are some people that will get transfusions from people, from willing donors, willing people. They'll pay them, I don't know how much, a couple hundred bucks each time is my guess. Who knows? Give them a couple hundred bucks each time to transfuse some of their blood into you. And by doing so, you live a little bit longer because your blood learns from the transfused blood and builds upon it and keeps you young. I mean, that's a known thing. And yeah, there are blood boys, you know, in Hollywood that are paid to just transfuse their blood into other people just because it helps keep them a little bit younger. They do eventually die. That happens. I mean, there's nothing stopping that, but it keeps them healthier longer. That's not the same as cooking people into meat pies the way that w originally was claimed about the Jewish community back in the Middle Ages. That's not the same as scaring kids to get adrenochrome flowing through their body and then drinking their blood. That's insane. Okay, that doesn't happen. But okay, let's keep listening to this conspiracy theorist scream and cry and propagandize 
about blood boys or about people drinking blood or whatever other thing. God, they have some weird obsession with blood, don't they? My God, dude. Jim Cavizil, Cavizil tried to expose it and was called crazy, but it's the truth. Jim Caviezel, remember that name. Jim Caviezel tried to expose it. Truth. This is what is being used. These people worship the devil. Okay, so Jim Caviezel tried to expose it. You notice what he said there? This is deep lore. Many people may, may not have remembered this, but I remember this because I got a memory like an elephant. I remember everything. Back in uh, November 2021, yeah, November 2021, Jim Caviezel was, I believe he played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ, which is an incredibly influential movie. Oh, my God. Well, as it turns out, he's a QAnon or nutcase. Jim Caviezel is. Go figure, right? Well, at this conference, Jim Caviezel, QAnoner, quoted Braveheart completely unironically and with a straight face in such a way that you, you would have never guessed that he was even quoting Braveheart. Listen to what he had to say. Late November 2021, trying to warn people to try to make them take the threat, quote unquote, more seriously. Check it out. Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live for at least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you have been willing to trade all the years from this day to that for one chance? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that you can take our lives, but you can never take our freedom. Every man dies. Got it. Okay, so he's supposed to yell. Like, th this is part of the speech. You can take our lives, but you can never take our freedom. You know, that's the big thing. And he just kind of waltzes right past it. But you can never take our freedom. Every man dies. It's terrible, dude. This guy's an actor. Come on. But you can take our lives. But you can never take our freedom. Every man dies. Yeah. Not every man truly lives. You, 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 you. We must fight for that authentic freedom and live, my friends. By God, we must live. And with the Holy Spirit as your shield and Christ as your sword, may you join St. Michael in all the... And your mom in my bed. Just said defending God and sending Lucifer and his henchmen straight right back to hell where they belong. So, uh, yeah, anyway, the point is he was at a QAnon conference when he decided to quote Braveheart. <laughs> God, dude. Uh, again, Mel Gibson, like, directed. God, what was uh, Passion of the Christ? That was it, yeah. Mel Gibson directed Passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson is a complete far-right nutter butter of epic proportions like unglued from reality entirely so that's how jim caviezel knows mel gibson who actually originally gave that that speech in braveheart anyways yeah so QAnon is rearing their ugly head once again of course and they're making fools of themselves as always just want to give you a little bit of background into i mean that that was some of the newer stuff that happened at the Reawaken America tour. Let me show you some of the older stuff that happened at the Reawaken America tour, like some of the past things that took place. Late March 2022, this is a person named Scott McKay. He calls himself Patriot Street Fighter. Listen to what he says here. This is uh, late March 2022, if I didn't say that, yeah. You are now in this war. That's why you're here. Are you going to answer Christ's call? Are you going to be part of the ascending Christ consciousness? See, they're everything that they say, every word out of these people's mouths, not just at the Reawaken America tour, very obviously there also, but even in regular conferences, even other QAnon conferences like Jim Caviezel gives, everything they say is intended to scare the bejesus out of everybody around them at any cost. That's the goal. It's so sad. Are you going to answer Christ's call? Are you going to be part of the ascending Christ consciousness on this planet so we bury this satanic architecture which has infiltrated every aspect of society? The Kazarian Mafia has been killing you. They're now killing you in hospitals. So uh, you may not have caught on to that. I didn't catch that the first time, but somebody mentioned it to me in the comments when I 
first saw this clip years and years ago, but did you catch his mention there of the Kazarian Mafia? It's subtle, but let me just read a little blurb about what the Kazarian Mafia is. Something I bet you probably haven't even heard of. I hadn't heard of it until I saw his little thing about it. This is... ISDglobal.org, an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory is being shared on Telegram to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Of course, right? Again, this clip came out late March 2022, so this is the perfect time for him to start justifying the war against Ukraine by the Russians. Like any major crisis in the digital age, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has spurred a barrage of conspiracy theories and disinformation online. While allusions to the usually misrepresented past are common in many conspiracy theories focused on geopolitics, history has become a particularly hot topic in this case. From denying Ukrainians' ethnic identity to decrying its government as fascists, Distortions of history have become tools used to undermine Ukraine's right to exist as an independent and democratic state. As with many contemporary conspiracy theories, anti-Semitism has been present in several narratives about the invasion, ranging from direct attacks on Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's Jewish heritage to tropes about global elites having their sinister plans foiled by Putin's decision to invade. One of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories being used to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the Kazarian Mafia. So let me just give you a general idea from my understanding of what the Kazarian Mafia is, the way that he's referring to it, okay? From my understanding, the Kazarian Mafia is supposed to be a Jewish mafia that exists in the country of Ukraine and controls it. And Zelensky is one of the Kazarian mafia leaders. Of course, it's completely made up entirely by Russia in an attempt to scare people and bolster credibility of claims made by Russia, try to make Russia's aggressive behavior more justified. It's completely made up. But the claim goes like this. Zelensky is one of the Kazarian Mafia leaders, and the war is being waged actually by Ukraine against Russia, not the other way around. So the Kazarian Mafia has set out to attack Russia because they hate them or some other nonsense. It's just another subtle way, a another subtle dig against Ukrainians and against people that have brains. It's just another piece of propaganda spread around by Russia that, wouldn't you know it, conveniently ended up right in the hands of QAnoners. Weird how that works, huh? How does Russian propaganda that is oddly specific always end up in the hands of these QAnoners? Quite the coincidence, if you ask me. But okay, let's listen to this guy talk about this super coincidental argument that the Kazarian Mafia is out to get you or whatever. Are you going to be part of the ascending Christ consciousness on this planet so we bury this satanic architecture which has infiltrated every aspect of society? The Kazarian Mafia has been killing you. So the Kazarian Mafia is like the deep state, I guess. Kazarian Mafia is like pulling strings like puppet masters to try to control you and make your, your life completely miserable any way they possibly can. That's the idea here. They're now killing you in hospitals. They're killing you in the streets. They launched Antifa and BLM. That's when I blew the gasket. That's when he blew the gasket? Okay, interesting. So the claim is that the Kazarian Mafia the Jewish elites that control Ukraine created BLM and Antifa in an attempt to destroy America, to destroy Ukraine and Russia and everything else, just because they hate all these people, apparently, just because they hate population centers. They just want them gone. So they're going to create 
you know, Antifa and BLM to just wreak havoc on everything. It's insane. And you know what's even more insane about this stuff? That they believe it. That this guy actually believes what he's saying, in my humble opinion. He actually believes this nonsense. He really does think that there's some Kazarian mafia out there trying to take advantage of people and get rich and ruin society and all this other garbage. It's nuts. This is who they have at the Reawaken America tour, okay? This is who Eric Trump endorses. This is who Michael Flynn endorses. And tacitly, Trump endorses him too. When I blew the gasket, that's when I said, okay, no governor, no president, no state legislature is going to say it then I'm going to say it. I'm going to come out and I'm going to rain this shit storm down on all these scumbags until they are dead. I mean, that's violent action if I've ever heard it, right? Just deeply, deeply disturbing stuff. I mean, there are countless people that come on stage at these events, at these Reawaken America tours and say very similar stuff. Hell, this guy right here, Mark Burns, Right here, this guy was shouted out by Trump recently. A clip of Mark Burns was retweeted by Donald Trump publicly about Mark Burns saying how honest Trump is and how trustworthy he is and everything else. Mid-May 2023, Mark Burns comes out on stage at the Reawaken America tour and says this. God only made two genders. He knows that line gets applause usually. I can't hear nobody. So you got to get to the point where you realize that when they smack you in the face. Okay, when they smack you in the face. He's a pastor, by the way. The answer from a pastor is you turn the other cheek. Everybody knows that. That's the answer. That's what Jesus said. Someone smacks you in the face, you. You smack them back two times harder. Okay, that I don't remember that part in the Bible. That's not clicking with me. So there's a hang up here somewhere. Oh, yeah, I thought I was about to say something else. Yeah, I thought you were going to quote the Bible. My mistake. You're a pastor. I was expecting you to go with a biblical answer. What Jesus had to say about that. All right. Okay, that works to smack the sh out of him, I guess. The Bible said that we take the, the violence, take it, and we take it by force. We are here to ready to take this nation back. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, the only man that God has anointed here in 2024 to be the next president of the United States of America. And that is Don O. J. I mean, not for nothing, but look at the microphone he's holding. Let me just see if I can scroll back. Check this out. Red, white, blue. The microphone is red, white, and blue. Isn't that interesting? Aside from that, I find it particularly fascinating that they are creating their own interpretation of the Bible in real time. Jesus unequivocally and without question said, if somebody slaps you, you turn the other cheek. You move on. You go away. You find your own thing to do. Ignore it. That's very clearly what he said, right? These people have found a justification in the Bible to do the exact opposite of what Jesus said. This is further proof that the Bible is nothing but a gigantic collection of 66 books, I think 32,000, 33,000 different verses written by dozens of authors over thousands of years who all had different political positions and religious beliefs and ideological and political beliefs and, and beliefs across the spectrum. If there's a moral or ethical position that you want to justify in the Bible, it's doable. You just have to find the right verses for it. Every single moral position can be justified if you look hard enough. And that's what we're watching happening right now. Anyway, that's uh, the Trumpist movement right now. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. It's just disgusting to me. Like I said, guy was retweeted by Trump not too long ago. Yeah. Tell me what you think in the comments. 
Next, we're going to talk about televangelist Jesse Duplantis's absolute obsession with money. He cannot give it up. And this isn't new. It's been like this for decades. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. Jesse, you're the new guy. I can't hear you. I said, you're the new guy here. I'm the new guy. I'm the shortest one. <laughs> but I'm also the richest. No. <laughs> This is televangelist Jesse Duplantis, the short guy on stage here, the one that was just talking. Obviously completely obsessed with money to the core. Like, that seems to be the only thing that he ever thinks about. What kind of a joke is that to tell, right? Oh my God. Like, how does he not crawl into a hole and just die of shame after saying something like that? Seriously. That was from mid-May 2023. He did an appearance on this TV show called Flashpoint. It's owned and operated by Kenneth Copeland, and it's kind of like a, I don't know, a Q&A or like a commentary on the news with a number of different pastors or influential people. Sometimes they have members of Congress on to talk. Uh, Gene Bailey's here on the left. He's a pastor. He hosts it. Uh, Rick Green here in the middle. This guy is the leader of something called... Patriot Academy, I think, something to that effect, where it trains patriots to do patriotic things, quote unquote. Dude on the right is Hank Kuhneman. I mean, they got all kinds of televangelists and stuff on there. So anyway, the point is Jesse Duplantis is obsessed with money, always has been, seemingly always will be. So I want to get a little look back. Some of his top appearances, not just on Flashpoint, some of it is on Flashpoint, but on other programs too, on his own program, just to give you an idea of how obsessed with money this guy really is. Now, before we watch this, I want to remind you of something. There's a verse in the Bible where Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God quote unquote that's what the verse said that's what jesus said right seems to me this guy has an uphill battle if he wants to get into heaven especially with how absolutely obsessed with money he really is listen to this one august 2nd 2022 should give you a little bit of a picture of who the guy is americans are revolutionary we've had enough we've had enough Republican, Democrat, liberal, independent, whatever, we'll get to a point when people are saying, like they're saying, we're going to seize your bank account. <laughs> mm, okay, guys talking about revolution and people will come to a point where they've had enough and they're going to start fighting and they're going to get what they need. How did he manage to turn it back to bank accounts? How did that happen? How did we end up all the way back here? This is confusing. When people are saying, like they're saying, we're going to seize your bank account. <laughs> Not mine. You better have something in your hand if you try. Mm -hmm. Not Dude, this guy is so obsessed with his bank account and with his money. It's an embarrassment. How does he live with himself? Seriously. How does he come on stage every day and sit here with the rest of these guys and say some of the stuff that he says brazenly and openly about how much he loves money? This is too much. I don't mean that arrogantly, see? Sure. You'll get to a point. I don't, mean, I don't mean that arrogantly, he said. Well, how else did you mean it? How else could it possibly be taken but arrogantly? If you try. Mm -hmm. now, I don't mean that arrogantly, see? Sure. You'll get to a point where people will stand up sure. and say, enough is enough. Amen. And it's getting close. Amen. It really is. I believe you're right. And, and Jesus is coming, and we thank God for that. It's just painful. He always finds a way to route everything back to money and giving him what you have here's another clip of him early may 2017 we're going all the way back in the archives check out what he had to say to his congregation about them donating money to him uh yesterday somebody blessed me walked up to him and just shook and had some money in there i said thank you i received that what a blessing of the lord Years ago, I would say, no, 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 no. And I thought, Lord, I'm sorry. He said, Jesse, I can bless your ministry, but I can't bless you. And you know why I wouldn't let that happen? It wasn't because of pride, because I'm, I come out of a work generation. So 
Okay, I don't understand what that means. I can bless your ministry, but I can't bless you? What does that even mean? Yeah, it's hard to accept money from people, but you know what I've come to find? There are two things that I've come to find about accepting donations from people. Number one, that donation objectively furthers the goals of the movement and of my own life. I can do more with that money to further the goals of the movement than I could without it. That's the first aspect of this. And here's the second aspect. It makes somebody feel good to know that they are furthering the goals of the movement or even just your life. You know, maybe you gave something back to them. Maybe you just talking about these issues that are taking place made them feel better about those issues. And giving money back to the movement makes them feel good about the situation, makes them feel happy about it. So I'm actually not opposed to people donating money if they want to donate money. Difference is this guy solicits it from people grossly, like disgustingly. In fact, he says, if you don't donate to me, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. He gets really bad with some of the stuff that he says. Just keep listening here and we'll get there. So he's trying to justify taking donations from people. I'm actually perfectly okay with that. So automatically when people would do that, I'd say, no, no, I work, I, I, I'll take care of it. It wasn't a pride thing, it's just the way I was taught. And then and when the Lord told me, I said, Lord, forgive me of that. He said, would it hurt your feelings if you wanted to bless Kathy? And she'd go, no, no. Would you get your feelings hurt if you went to bless Jody? And she'd go, no, Dad, I work for it. I, I don't want nothing. I said, well, yeah. He said, then why do you want to hurt me? And I said, Lord, you said hundredfold with persecution. He said, well, they persecuted me. Is that a problem? I said, well, Percy ain't cute. So no, I guess it did. It's just. Okay, but well, Percy ain't cute. So I guess it did. This is just painful, dude. He's trying to justify it. You, you don't have to justify it. Just like it moves the movement further. It moves your life further to have more money. And it makes people feel good about themselves. And it, it makes people feel good knowing that they have contributed to the movement in some small way. That's all you got to say. But what he's set up here, this whole conglomeration that he's set up, in the way that he set it up is absolutely disgusting and inexcusable. It's just giving God glory. It's okay to brag on God. It's okay to brag on God, i.e. It's okay to brag about how much money I have because God gave it to me. That's what he's really saying. It's okay to brag on God. God gave me this money. God gave me this Ferrari. God gave me this private jet. So I can brag about having these things. That's his justification. So not only is he trying to justify taking donations from people, he's trying to justify owning all of this vast, disgusting amounts of wealth. Check this one out. This was at like a, what would you call it? Like, a, I don't know, a telethon or something on the Victory Network. Again, Victory Network owned and operated by Kenneth Copeland. And Jesse Duplantis is actually here with Kenneth Copeland. And this should give you even more insight into who the guy is and what he believes and how he views money in an unhealthy way. I honestly believe this, that the reason why Jesus hadn't come is because people are not giving the way God told them to give. That is as predatory as it gets. Is it just me? If you give me more money, if you put more money from your bank account into my bank account, Jesse Duplantis, Jesus comes back. That's some predatory shit right there. You see what I'm saying? Wow. I mean, when you understand, it, you can speed up the time. I was on television. He said, I heard you was a millionaire. I said, that's not right. That's not true. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. Multi. Now, add that to it, you'll be all right. <laughs> oh, he couldn't handle that. He liked to have had a fit. And I said, you mess with me, I'll buy this station and I'll fire you. Yeah. Well, like, that's a disgusting story. It shows what kind of a human being this guy is. You know what I would do if this guy, you know, what, a janitor or something at this studio starts criticizing how much money I have? I'd buy the studio and I'd give him 
a job that was worth $300,000 a year. In my opinion, the primary problem in the United States, the biggest problem that we have really is how concentrated at the top the wealth is. If I had that much money, I would spread it around to as many people as humanly possible. It's really the government's job to do that through taxation and welfare programs and stuff and social security, whatever else. But since the government's not doing any of that stuff, I would absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, find ways to spread that money far and wide. Give it to as many people as humanly possible. And this really draws the distinction between me and Jesse. Jesse Duplantis revels in making people suffer. You start pointing out how much money I make, I'm going to buy this place that you work at, and I'm going to fire you. And you won't make a dime from that point on. That's his position. What's the more virtuous position, the more virtuous thing to do? Give the guy a pay raise. He doesn't like that you make more than him or, or that you make just an absolutely obscene amount of money. Give him more. Give him some of it. Share it with him. That should at least alleviate the problem. That's just not how Jesse views it. It's just disgusting, man. It's disgusting on every level. And here we are with Jesse begging other people for their money at this telethon. Disgusting. Does it get more disgusting than that? I had a fit, and I said, you mess with me, I'll buy this station, and I'll fire you. Yeah. Boy, he didn't like that, did he? Did. But, uh, you know, I like, people are laughing. Kenneth Copeland's laughing. Lance Walna is laughing. He's the guy in the middle here in the blue suit. Hank Kuhneman, black suit. I, I honestly love that black suit. Big fan. He's laughing. Mario Murillo laughing at this story. Jesse Duplantis telling a story about being filthy rich and threatening this guy to buy the studio he works at and fire him. And they're laughing. This should show you what type of people they are. Ever wonder, behind closed doors, are these people really scumbags? Or are they really good people? We don't have to wonder. We don't have to go behind closed doors. We can see it right in front of us. They're scumbags. All of them. I had a fit, and I said, you mess with me, I'll buy this station, and I'll fire you. Boy, yeah. oh, he didn't like that, then he did. Uh, you know, that was a little fleshy, but it felt good. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Just did. You know what I'm saying? So it, it felt sinful. I know that I just sinned, but I enjoyed that sin. It, I just did. I enjoyed that sin. That's what it just said. Yeah, people usually enjoy sins. That doesn't surprise me. What surprises me is that a televangelist, supposed to be the arbiter of God on earth, filthy rich, is laughing about the sin that he just committed. <laughs> just did you know what I'm not saying wrong. so I realize that I will not move people emotionally yeah. to give right no I'm gonna have people move according to the Word of God what is God saying to you and I really believe this if people would call this number <clears throat> and put this victory all over the world on every available voice mm -hmm. every available outlet mm -hmm. God, the father he would say Jesus go get him yeah because you see he wants to see us as much as we want to see him so what he just said, uh, it was subtle, but let's just step back. Listen one more time and listen closely here and think about what he's saying, okay? <laughs> just did, you know what I'm not saying? Wrong. So I realized that I will not move people emotionally yeah. to give. Right, no. I'm going to have people move according to the word of God. What is God? No, he is moving people emotionally. That's the whole point of what he's doing here have people move according to the word of God. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? I know what he's saying to me. God's saying to me, if you donate everything that you have up to and including your mortgage money, the money that you need to pay your, your house bill, the money that if you don't pay it to the mortgage company, they take your house. If you pay that to me, Jesus will come back and you're not even going to need to pay them anyways. That's really what this guy is saying right now. 
Give me everything. Your mortgage money, your electric bill, your water bill, your everything, your savings, your stocks, your bonds, everything. If you give me that money, Jesus will be back. That's what this guy is saying right now. It's subtle, but it's there. Listen again. I'm going to have people move according to the word of God. What is God saying to you? And I really believe this. If people would call this number <clears throat> and put this victory all over the world on every available voice, every available outlet, God, the father, he would say, Jesus, go get him. Yeah. Because you see, he wants to see us as much as we want to see him. You see what I'm saying? And so what has hindered all these things is, right. uh, uh, it's because people are not doing in the financial realm because we live in an economic world, what God's called them to do. So give me your mortgage money. Give me your electric bill and Jesus will come back instantly. That's what you need to do. If people just gave me their mortgage money, Jesus would be back. You know, he's called us to do that. So I don't have a problem with giving. I don't have a problem with receiving. It, it doesn't make any difference. That's what she said. I just made up my mind. I want Jesus to come. Now, uh, That's also what she said. They said, do you own a jet? Yes. You can have it the day after the rapture. It's yours. Because <laughs> Jesse, Jesse is uh, going to heaven. You know, just in the strictest reading of the context in the Bible, I wouldn't be so sure about that. He seems awfully confident in that assertion that he's going to heaven. I would venture to guess I know the Bible better than Jesse Duplantis. And I would say, according to the Bible, he's not. In fact, I would bet everything that I own that Jesse Duplantis is not going to heaven like he thinks he is. And uh, that whole jet thing, that came up for a very specific reason. I wanted to introduce you to Jesse Duplantis. This is your introduction if you don't know who the guy is. This is what he's all about. But something you may not be aware of is that he was the other guy in the conversation with Kenneth Copeland when Copeland basically said that commercial airliners were just tubes full of demons. Basically saying that everybody on an, a commercial air, airliner is a demon. Listen to this conversation again now that you have that context in mind and know who Jesse Duplantis is and the positions that he holds. Listen to this one more time. Uh, 2015 is when this came out. Okay. As I was going home, the Lord real quickly, he said, Jesse, do you like your plane? Now, you know, I thought that's an odd statement. He gave, I said, well, certainly, Lord. He said, do you really like it? And I thought, well, yes, Lord. Jesus is not talking to Jesse Duplantis. I don't know if you believe that Jesus speaks to people here on earth or not. I don't know if you believe that God has an active role in people's lives. I don't know. But no matter what, in my opinion, whether God has an active role in people's lives or not, he certainly doesn't have an active role in this guy's life. I can say that one without a shadow of a doubt. So this story right off the bat seems completely fabricated to me. But okay. You really like it. And I thought, well, yes, Lord. He said, then he said this. So that's it? I didn't know how to handle that. I went, what? He said, you're going to let your faith stagnate? And when he said that, that shocked me. I went, whoa, wait. I literally unbuckled my seatbelt, my plane. I stood up. My pilots looked right and said, do you need something? I said, no, no, I'm talking to God right now. <laughs> and he went back to flying. I said, yeah, I would have to imagine that being a, like a, a pilot for a televangelist, a filthy rich, almost billionaire televangelist, if they're not already billionaires, I'd have to imagine that'd be a weird job, right? You'd see them doing all kinds of weird shit in the back. Up to and including, maybe not limited to, cocaine. I would bet anything these guys are sitting back there snorting the nose candy. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think about that. I suspect that's what they do on those private jets. They know they can't pull their little tray table down on the commercial airliners with their little fella sitting next to them. Just kind of pull the table closer to them and take the little take the little pack and open it up and, you know, kind of pour it out, tap, 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 and take their little credit card and 
scoot it up into a little thing and a dollar bill roll that puppy up and they can't do that on a public airliner that's not a that's not allowed you guys don't think that's why they have private jets do you i'm starting to wonder lord i don't think i was letting my faith stagnate he said so this is all i could ever do i said you want you you're trying to tell me something. He's not trying to tell you anything, Jesse. You're making this story up, and it's nonsense. You couldn't have done that on an airliner. Dude, do you think somebody comes in and eats these fruits? Is there, or are, Do they just throw these fruits away when they're done with them? Are these, are these decorative? Are they wax? Or are these real fruits? Do they, do they give these fruits to like the homeless outside? Certainly not, right? So Jesse's talking about an experience he had, basically. I keep getting sidetracked. Thinking about Jesse Duplantis snorting coke off of the uh, tray table on an airplane. Anyway, so Jesse Duplantis describes standing up on his private jet and the the pilot looking back and saying, Is anything or everything okay, sir? He says, oh, I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God right now. Okay, so that's what happens. Go on. You couldn't have done that on an airliner. No, sir. No way. Stand up and say, what'd you say, Lord? I mean, it didn't happen anyways, but okay. I think, I honestly, I think it's the Coke that they can't do. That that's the thing that really upsets them. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. And the guy sitting over there saying, what the hell does he think he's doing? <laughs> you can't do you that. You can't do that. No, no. That, this, this is so important. And those of you that are, that are just now coming into these things, um, in, in the first place, Jesse and, 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 and I and, and others, Keith Moore and Creflo and all of us, they, the world is in such a shape. We Dude, he just listed the most devious of, of the most disgusting televangelists in existence. Creflo Dollar, all of the people he just named are plainly and blatantly out for every penny that they can get and nothing else okay so he says you can't do that on an airliner stand up and talk to god nor can you do cocaine off the tray table i'm just i mean that's neither here nor there just another thing that you can't do on an airliner just pointing that out the world is in such a shape we can't get there without this that's right we've got to have this now oral used to fly airlines right but it Oral Roberts, he's a famous televangelist back in the day. And uh, he was also Kenneth Copeland's mentor. He taught him how to do televangelism. Even back mm -hmm. there then, man, mm -hmm. it, it got to the place where it was agitating his spirit, sure. people coming up to him. He right. had become famous and they won't. Mm, being, a, being among normal people, I can see that's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Just being around the common folk. Yeah, that's got to be awful. I'm so sorry for Oral Roberts and for our old buddy Kenneth Copeland here. Poor people being around normal people like that. And everybody watching like that, you certainly can't roll up a dollar bill and stick it up your nose and take a line of cocaine, right? I mean, that's completely out of the question. It, it got to the place where it was agitating his spirit sure. people coming up to him he right. had become famous and they want him to pray for him and right. all that you you can't you, you can't manage that today right the, this dope filled world right and get in an air get in a long tube with a bunch of demons right that's exactly the and it, it's deadly and and it works on your heart it really does so that's the famous line right there that's the famous line where kenneth copeland basically accused everybody that takes a commercial plane of being a demon. How else am I supposed to take that? I understand he claims that's not what he meant, but bro, you're going to have to give me an explanation if that's not what you meant, because that's sure as hell what it sounded like. Anyways, Jesse Duplantis has been obsessed with money since the very beginning. He's always been obsessed with money, and it's simply disgusting. I don't know how he justifies this stuff to himself, honestly. Telling stories like he told earlier about buying a studio so he could fire some janitor? Really? Does it get more morally depraved than that? I can't think of a situation. It's disgusting. That's who the guy is, honestly. And to hear something like this from him... Jesse, you're the new guy. 
I said, you're the new guy here. Yeah, I'm the new guy. I'm the shortest one. <laughs> but I'm also the richest. No. <laughs> Hearing something like that from him doesn't surprise me in the least bit. That is his M.O. That's what the guy's all about. That's what he's always been about. This is not a surprise to anybody who has followed him from the beginning, like I have and like my audience has. Nothing new to see here. Just a guy being obsessed with money as usual. Anyway, let me know what you think about it in the comments. This guy is just terrible. Next, we're going to talk about Andrew Womack attempting to take over a school board and actually succeeding. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. When we get to heaven, I can guarantee you there's not a single one of you that's going to be saying, I wish you hadn't have encouraged me to give so much and that I'd have got my fifth flat screen TV. You're going to come up to me and hug my neck and kiss me and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for getting that money out of my pocket. This is Pastor Andrew Womack. He's been trying to break into politics for a long time, which, by the by, is illegal if he wants to keep tax-exempt status. He's perfectly free to say whatever he wants, endorse whatever political candidate he wants or party or whatever, oppose any political candidate or party or whatever he wants if he pays taxes. But, of course, he wants the best of both worlds and refuses to pay taxes but refuses to stop endorsing political candidates and, uh, and opposing political opponents. So he's been working behind the scenes for a long time, attempting to find his way into politics, find some way to gain political influence. And I'm sad to say he succeeded. Now, I do have some words of encouragement here. It feels bleak sometimes. A lot of the time there are like people like this guy, these Christian nationalist extremists, these MAGA people who find their way to political power and make a mess of things on their way out the door, right? Or even on their way in the door. They make a mess of things. But something I want you to keep in mind as we go through this video is that they don't have the numbers. Not even close. The numbers by a wide margin go with us. Anybody to the left of hunting the homeless for sport. This guy is terrible in his policy positions. Believes that people should be forced to go to church. Believes that this is a Christian nation. Believes that if you aren't Christian, you shouldn't be in it. That children should be taught the Ten Commandments in elementary school and made to memorize like all of the gospels and the whole nine yards like that's the type of person he is right but he knows he's not there yet so he's going to start with baby steps this guy actually succeeded in taking over a political uh what would you call it? like a, a political district in colorado so i wanted to talk about like this the nbc article that references him taking over this political district in his area. And I want to talk about how he did it and what his goals are moving forward so that maybe we can put a stop to this kind of thing. Or maybe even we can implement this exact type of plan in our own way to try to take over our own political districts. Because let me let you in on a little secret. People don't vote. If you can get somebody to vote your way, even a few people, it could sway the election. Not the general election necessarily, but on local levels, school board elections, uh, property surveyor selections, judge selections, even the smallest, lowest elections possible. It only takes a few people. Sometimes it, it, it's come down to like, Two people total. So let's look at his strategy. The strategy he used to take over this entire district. And maybe, just maybe, we can implement it to our own ends. Listen to what he had to say here. Early April 2022. This is him sounding the alarm about the evil LGBT community out to get all of the children. 
we decided that we were going to take Colorado back. Colorado is a very liberal place, and so we've got a thing in place, and uh, during the last election cycle, we started with the school boards, and we singled out five districts in Colorado, and we put out these voter guides, and out of 178 people that we were supporting, we got... I think it, I, I may get this wrong, but it was somewhere around 78 or 80 of them elected. You got to be careful with anything that you believe from this guy. He has a tendency to like lie through his teeth brazenly and for absolutely no reason. But he did get people elected who he wanted elected. And I'm talking extremists, true blue extremists. So he put up a voter guide to get 150 people elected, and he succeeded in getting 70 of them elected or so. His next goal is to put up another voter guide where he lists 150 people. Maybe he gets, hell, 30 elected next time. That's 30 more MAGA extremist nutcases on permanent judicial benches or in senator or house member positions that were not there before. Again, we need to take this method and use it ourselves. Pay attention to how he does this stuff because we need to be doing it too. Eight or 80 of them elected. And so we're beginning to make an inroad and um, We've got some big plans in place this year. I sent a spy into our public school system. A spy, okay. To check out what the books are. And I got a list of, I think it was 54 books in the Woodland Park school system. And this is a small place, 7,000 people in the community. And there's 54 homosexual books that we know of. 54 homosexual books that we know of. Wow. Okay. Well, let me tell you this. This is a lot of the time presented as the left grooming kids. That's not what's happening. Okay. There is a logarithmic scale of harm. If you are 15 years old or under being exposed to anything sex related, anything sexual at all is damaging and potentially scarring it's bad okay it starts getting less harmful at 15 16 17 18 19 20 uh, at that point i think the main problem is the power imbalance between two people more than anything you just shouldn't be any more than two years difference in age gap under any circumstances if you're dating a teenager. So if you're 18, 16's cutting it close. 17 and 18 year old dating, that's okay. 14, 15 year old dating, that's okay. Uh, 14, 16 year old dating, that's a little bit iffy. But at no point in time should anybody 15 or under ever be exposed to anything sexual by the adults in their lives or by anybody at all ever, period. Right. And the log the logarithmic scale starts to go down from 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 gets a little bit safer. Well, here's the thing. You ever seen a movie where there's a kid that's, say, seven years old? He's in elementary school and he's chasing after this girl. He's super obsessed with her. He really wants to be her boyfriend gives her flowers and serenades her and the whole nine yards, wants to be in her life, seven or eight years old. You've seen that, right? That's like a movie trope that, that shows up all the time. I don't really have a problem with that because that's real life. You know, people chase after other people. That's just part of the deal. What if the kid was gay? What if the boy is serenading another boy, bringing flowers to another boy? What's the fundamental difference there? There is none. There's no difference between a boy chasing after a boy and a boy chasing after a girl. The only difference is that one couple is gay and one couple is straight. Now, like I said, kids should never, ever be exposed to anything sexual under any circumstances, ever. But if you find yourself in a position where all of your friends are finding girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever, and you're a boy 
and you find that you're actually interested in having a boyfriend rather than a girlfriend, who are you going to turn to? It may not be entirely safe to turn to an adult. In fact, you have to be really, really careful with that conversation as an adult. You have to be real careful with it. It's not inappropriate or wrong. You just have to be careful. Make sure that you don't take advantage of the kid or expose the kid to an idea that could be damaging to them. It's dangerous, but you know what is safe? Providing access to a book that describes a kid in the exact same situation that you're in. Provide access to books that these kids can pick up and read at their leisure. Let them expose themselves to this side of society if they choose, and they will be perfectly safe. There's zero harm involved here. Now, there's a lot of nuance to this conversation, obviously, all the nuance I just explained. But the nuance goes right out the window with these people, and it's replaced with a single word, groomer, which, by the by, in my opinion, is a slur. It's the new F slur for gay people, in my opinion. The word groomer is no better than the F word for gay people. So the fact that 54 quote-unquote homosexual books, whatever that means, were in this district means that there are 54 different options that young kids have to choose from if they don't understand the feelings that they're experiencing right now. And they can do it in a safe way without contact with the outside world, without worrying about their parents finding out that maybe they had these questions or ideas, without worrying about the bully finding out that they had these questions. And what's this guy trying to do? In fact, what's he effectively succeeded in doing? Closing off any avenues children may have to find some kind of commonality between each other. Let me tell you a little story about myself. When I was a teenager, I was beaten relentlessly by my father with absolutely no reason or explanation or anything. My dad used to chase me down the hallway and I'd run to my bedroom and push a shelf in front of my door and lean against the shelf as he's pounding and pounding and pounding on this door and screaming, open this God door, open this door, open the door over and over and over again. When these types of situations took place after they were over, usually my mom would come home and she would play the violin softly, quietly. That was her way of coping. And that's the the one thing that I came out of that situation with. It is the thing that causes flashbacks in me, PTSD flashbacks, to hear the violin played softly the way my mom used to. Throws me back in the body of that 12-year-old boy sitting in front of the shelf as my dad banged on it and banged on it and banged on it. And you know what I did when I sat in that bedroom, hiding from my dad, hoping that he didn't beat that door down and grab me and throw me out the window or throw me through a wall? You know what I did? I read. There's a book that I read. I don't know the name of it now. If somebody knows the name of it, please put it in the chat. Tell me what the name of it was. I, I really want to know. There's a book about a boy that was moving from somewhere else to the United States, and he passed through Ellis Island. This is from the 1800s. I mean, Ellis Island was only in operation for like a couple of years before I think it burned down. But anyways, the boy passed through Ellis Island, saw the Statue of Liberty, and saw the, the inscription on the front and everything. Only he was beaten mercilessly by his father, too. And... Through various parts of that book, that boy had considered drinking drain cleaner to deal with the pain that he was dealing with, to bring it to an end. Now, I very obviously don't condone that. The book didn't condone that. The book didn't even encourage it. But you know what the book did do? It helped me relate. It helped me connect to somebody else 
who is having this exact same type of experience. Something that people at school or at church or friends or family or whatever couldn't possibly fathom, couldn't possibly know what it's like to be thrown to the ground, to see your mom step in front of your dad to protect you and just watch her be thrown aside like a rag doll as he ran after you anyways. Watch her fall flat on her ass in an attempt to protect you. That's something that I got from the book. A connection to somebody else who understood, who knew. A connection to somebody who was processing the same feelings I was processing in that moment. Now, ultimately, did I have a desire to drink drain cleaner? No. And neither did the boy in the book. But it was a thought that crossed my mind. And it was a thought that crossed the boy's mind, too. Andrew Womack, the guy on screen here, has systematically set out to remove any ability for somebody to relate to somebody else on any level at all. He has systematically, he sent spies into schools to prevent people from being able to experience or to read about the experiences of other people that are in their shoes. Now, mine was about physical abuse. These kids' experiences are about being gay, about having feelings for somebody of the opposite gender. Where are they going to get that solidarity now? Where are they going to get that connection now? They're not, and that's the point. They're not. Andrew Womack and other Christian nationalist extremists like him don't want people to have that connection. They don't want people to be able to build a bridge with somebody else who has also experienced this. There is absolutely no harm in making this stuff available to people. Pushing it on them, that could be harmful to their psyche. That could be scarring. Forcing kids to consume sexual content, that's scarring and bad and damaging and should be banned and is banned. Making it available for kids who are having bad experiences in their lives or unusual experiences like being gay that's not like standard in the united states it's not that it's kind of like anomalous i guess it's not what everybody expects of you to be a white christian male if you're not one of those three things white christian male cis if you're not one of those four things you're an anomaly and they want to snuff out every anomaly at any cost unfortunately this guy seems to have taken a step toward success. So hopefully you understand why this is bad. It's not just like, oh, okay, well, he removed 54 books from the library, whatever. Okay, fine. I mean, it's not great. It's not fantastic, but time will go on. You know, things will move forward, whether those books are in the library or not. No, if I hadn't had that book to read, I'd already had those thoughts running through my head about the drain cleaner long before that book came along. If I hadn't had that book to ground me, I may have drank it. Maybe that's the goal. Maybe that's the plan. Maybe that's what they want. They most definitely want to force people back in the closet, for sure. The more people come out of the closet, the more people realize that it's safe and okay and acceptable and fine to come out of the closet. And that is the absolute last thing that these people want not just for the gay community not just for the trans community but for anybody who doesn't fit into those four categories straight white male cis if you don't fit in there shut your mouth don't say a word and pretend you do and anyway, let's keep listening to andrew womack talk about his spy entering the school system that we know of 
and I got a list of that. And I've got people that are on my staff that go to every school board meeting and as soon as we get them looked at so that we can defend what we're saying, we're gonna stand up in the school board. We also ran and we now have a number of our Karis graduates that are on school board and we've got Christians in places and praise God, we're seeing things change. So he has strategically positioned people in positions of authority to make sure that it's more difficult for kids who are dealing with something hard to find some kind of solidarity with somebody else, to find some kind of connection with the outside world. This is early May 2023. This should draw out for you exactly what Andrew Womack intends to do. In fact, what he's succeeded in doing, largely. I believe that God has raised up this ministry uh, and has given us the influence that we have, not only to touch individuals, but to make a difference. Well, really, yeah, he's right. He is touching individuals for the worse. He's making their lives worse. He's making it so that they have no connection with the outside world, so they have no way of relating with or connecting to anybody who's dealing with something similar to them. Good job, Andrew. I hope you're happy with yourself. In this nation. And so I'm still praying about it. And I don't know exactly where we're going, but I'm more and more convinced all of the time that, man, we need to, we need to increase our scope. And we need to be far beyond just dealing with individuals. We need... Remember, the guy succeeded in taking over a local district, a local school board, and succeeded in pushing out any books that could provide comfort or solidarity or explanations or anything to anybody who is gay or trans. Remember, he succeeded in pushing this stuff out of his school district. So every kid in Andrew Womack's district now has nowhere to turn if they need something the way that I needed something. And now he says, we need to think on a larger level. Convinced all of the time that, man, we need to, we need to increase our scope. And we need to be far beyond just dealing with individuals. We need to be dealing with communities. And, man, as many people as we have in this school here, we ought to take over Woodland Park. And they did. They did. They took over Woodland Park, as he said. And so this Citizens Academy is to hopefully get you engaged and recognizing that, man, we've got a tremendous opportunity. This, uh, this county, right, let's just start right here with the county. This county ought to be uh, totally dominated by believers. And some people think, well, you know, we shouldn't be flexing our muscle. We shouldn't be doing this. Well, we should. Why? Is that what Jesus said? Did Jesus say go and flex your muscles and force everybody around you to be exactly like you. And if you don't force everybody to be just like you, or if they refuse to be just like you, then hang them from the town square. I don't remember that. You know what I remember? I remember Jesus saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Something to that effect, right? I remember Jesus talking a lot about... People living and let live. Remember any of that? No, he doesn't want that. He doesn't want any of it. He wants to impose his beliefs on the people around him at any cost. And it's simply disgusting. For what it's worth, let me show you what this guy is imposing on other people. Let me show you the propaganda that this guy has been using to take over Woodland Park, Colorado. Let me show you what he believes. This is mid-September 2022. A friend of mine in Illinois actually knows a teacher that comes to uh, school as a furry and wears ears and a tail and uses a litter box at the front of the classroom to relieve himself. 
Yeah, of course, this is complete nonsense. If this was actually happening, it would be front page news from here to Texas. But of course, it's completely made up. Would you expect any differently from somebody like this? Made up from beginning to end. But this is what they're pushing on children now. This is what he's doing with his district that he bought. He's convincing everybody that the Christians are the persecuted ones, and he needs to set out to persecute the others rather than being persecuted by anybody other than Christians. In reality, Christians were never persecuted in this district. This was all about taking control at any cost. And he succeeded in this one district. Now, this one district, it's not that big of a deal. Could be worse. It's a blue state. Eventually, it will almost certainly flip blue again. So I don't want you to, like, get, you know, get too upset over the fact that this district was lost to people on the right. It will turn blue again. But the fact that he is attempting to use this as a kind of pattern to expand to the rest of the United States should be disturbing to everybody. Everybody. You take a look at uh, this one. This is just another example of one of the ideologies that he is exporting to the people of Woodland, Colorado, to the people in the district that he took over. This one is from uh, 2021, by the by. Give this a listen. You know, this is something that's very politically incorrect and will be... Uh, a lot of people will find this to be upsetting, but I tell you, the things that are happening in our nation, it is a doctrine of the devil. Mm -hmm. It's not just people with a different opinion. It is demonic. And the people who... So this is one of my big problems right here. You shouldn't be calling your enemies demonic, in my opinion. You shouldn't be... Uh, I, I've seen Vosh doing this a lot, too. I mean, not to do a call-out here or whatever, but, you know, the Majority Report's done this. Uh, TYT has done this. You, you shouldn't do this, okay? You can't call this stuff out when you're doing it, too. It's either wrong for everybody or it's wrong for nobody. In my opinion, you just shouldn't be calling your enemies demons or demonic or linked to demons or any of that other garbage is demonic and the people who are doing it are being influenced and controlled by the devil. These are doctrines of demons that a man can just choose to be a woman. He can choose to go into a woman's, woman's restroom because he feels like a woman today. Uh, just complete misrepresentation of the entire situation, of course. That is nothing but an excuse for perverts. It's wrong. It you know if you passed a law saying that only biological, like men that were assigned male at birth, only those people were allowed into men's rooms and vice versa. Only women who were assigned women at birth were allowed in women's rooms. You'd get this exact same problem anyways, right? I know Buck Angel has a lot of problems. I don't agree with a lot of the problems that Buck Angel has created or, or uh, you know, I don't agree with Buck Angel as a human being or whatever. They've got terrible takes on a ton of stuff. It, that's not really what this is all about. But this is Buck Angel. Like I said, I, I have problems with Buck Angel's um, ideology, the things that he says and everything else. I don't like Buck Angel by and large, but... If you make it so that only women who were assigned female at birth are allowed in women's rooms and only men who were assigned male at birth are allowed in men's rooms, I know you're trying to prevent big burly men from entering women's rooms, but guess what, guys? This person in front of us was assigned female at birth. So go ahead and pass the bill that prevents women from or that prevents trans women from entering women's rooms you're going to end up with this person in your women's room legally speaking if you pass that law i mean the ultimate solution to the problem that the right has with the trans community is just getting rid of them just eradicate them as michael Knowles said eradicate transgenderism from public life entirely i believe is what he said 
If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. So they don't just want to make a situation where only men can enter women's spaces or vice versa, or whatever it is. They want to eradicate it from society. And like I said, Andrew Womack, friend of Kenneth Copeland, has succeeded in taking over Woodland, Colorado. We have to fight against this stuff. As Barack Obama says, I think, the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. And as Jon Stewart says, no, it doesn't. People bend it toward justice. It bends toward justice because people are doing it. People are forcing it that way. People are filing the lawsuits. People are speaking out. People are on social media talking about these issues that are happening right now. People are sharing clips of Michael Knowles saying we need to eradicate transgenderism from society. People are talking about this. That's what bends the moral arc of the universe toward justice. It doesn't just get there itself. Anyway, let me know what you think about it in the comments. I'm disgusted by the fact that this guy seems to have successfully created a pattern that can be used throughout the rest of the United States to push his extremist Christian nationalist agenda to everybody from here to Texas. That's disturbing to me, and we need to do something about it. That's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check me out on Patreon and take a look at my YouTube channels. Owen Morgan, where I talk about religious issues. Telltale Fireside Chat, where I talk about politics. Telltale Unfiltered, where I do long-form breakdowns of stuff like this. And Telltale Reads, where I read books by televangelists and others. I release everything in parts, but every part stands independently of the last. So you can jump in anywhere, and I'll make sure it makes sense. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of all my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything. All links are in the description. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.